are you? <laughs> I'm John Lydon. I'm half a century young and looking good at it. John Lydon, do you know that Sue Catwoman's kids have a band too? No, I don't know. Gosh, I must be out of date. Do you find all this out on Twitter? <laughs> Exactly. They're called Good Weather Girl, and it made me think, when was the last time you saw us? Oh, I remember the Weather Girls. <laughs> no, not the Weather Girls, although they were good. Oh, I used to love the Weather Girls. They were hilarious. When did you last see the Weather Girls? Oh, that's ages back now. But me, I like all kinds of music. When was the last time you saw Sue Catwoman, John Lydon? Long time ago. Why do you insist on adopting that John Lydon moniker? Well, should I just call you Johnny then, or yeah, John? Yeah, John. John, please. It sounds a bit too formal, and uh, it's rather like being interrogated by a uh, Norwegian police. <laughs> okay, I guess it's just to help identify you to the radio listeners out there. In case okay, people wonder, gotcha. So I understand what the format is. In case people are wondering who I am talking to, but they will recognize the voice from many years of rockin'. And also, John, you are a gooner, aren't you? You are a gooner. Uh, I've supported Arsenal since I was four years old, yes. Oh. I would be very careful of the term gooner, though, because that's a term uh, uh, which, in its original format, was uh, applied to the Arsenal football hooligans <laughs> and not the regular fans. I was phoning you here from Vancouver, B.C., and we once had an NASL team called the Vancouver Whitecaps, and there were some connections between the Whitecaps and Arsenal. And I was wondering if you could tell the people about Alan Ball. He used to play for the Whitecaps. Oh, Alan Ball of Arsenal fame? Yes, he played for the Whitecaps. Oh, most wonderful player. Loved that man's skill and style on the ball. Uh, his career really was made at Everton, and he kind of finished up at Arsenal. But, you know, we love him still. A legend. He played for the Vancouver Whitecaps, helped them win I the... I doubt if he does that now. I mean, he must be nearly, nearly 60. Well, he did in 1979. He helped win the soccer ball. But I was just thinking, there's quite That's a few... That's fantastic. Do... No, I'm really pleased you, you brought that up, because... Right? Uh, I, I love to hear of, like, uh, of old players doing well, you know, in their, in their retirement years. Another because far, far too many of them are, I don't know, sent to the knacker's yard, you know, like poor old horses for dog food. John, another player that played on the Whitecaps from Arsenal was John Samuels. Do you remember? Oh, yes, Johnny Samuels. What can you tell the people about Johnny Samuels? Well, he was an odd player. Some didn't like him at all, because he could be fairly inconsistent. But for me, he wore the red and white of Arsenal, therefore perfect. I'm sure. very loyal to my Arsenal. Yes. In fact, I'm a loyal person generally, except to uh, the royal family. <laughs> Well, thank you for answering these Arsenal questions because I've one last one here about Arsenal. We had Pierce O'Leary play for the Whitecaps. Who? Not Pierce O'Leary, who is David O'Leary's brother. Oh, that's fun. And I think David O'Leary, isn't he the classic Arsenal player? Isn't he one of the most famous Arsenal yes, players yes, ever? Yes, yes, and he went on to be an unclassic manager for such teams as Leeds United. <laughs> Uh, I used to kind of, uh, David O'Leary used to drink in a pub I used to drink in, around the back of Finsbury Park. Was that the Sir... He comes from a time when Arsenal players actually used to uh, socialise with the locals. Was that the Sir George Roby pub? No, it was the Moray Arms. What was the Sir George Roby pub like? That was quite a famous pub, wasn't it? It was alright, it was a local. It's an it was a pub that used to celebrate the comedian George Roby. So it was, a, it was a very good atmosphere to be growing up in, surrounded by reminiscences of comedy. John, it, and, it, and for me, a perfect backdrop to my career. Well, John Lydon, it's an honor to speak to you, and I've been trying to speak to you since, believe it or not, October the 14th, 1984, when Pill played in Vancouver at the War Memorial Gymnasium with punk rock band DOA. Do you remember that gig at all? 1984, Vancouver. You were wearing pajamas and were covered in spit. 
I remember not many gigs because, as you must understand, I've performed almost continuously for nearly 30 years now. Uh, but I, I always have fond memories of Canada, uh, in particularly Toronto, because I have family there. You will always run into these idiots that just love to spit at you, and they, because they've read it in the newspapers and have been ill-informed that that be the done thing. It should not be the done thing. You're spreading your disease. Uh, I, I had, when I was young, a very, very serious illness called meningitis, which put me in a coma for three months. Uh, the, when I came out of that coma, apart from losing my memory, some of the side issues I've had to live with all my life is very, very bad sinus problems. And so when I'm on stage, every now and again I have to clear either my nostril or my throat from phlegm. I overproduce those two issues. Uh, but I do not spit at an audience, and I do not expect them to spit at me. Has I always have a bucket neatly placed. So, if spitting be your proclivity in life, bring your own bucket. John, has the spitting stopped? Do people still spit? Of course. Of course. How about... Ages ago. And I'm touring now with Public Image, which is a very different kind of audience, really, where uh, people don't feel the need to try to be ignorant which is a, an unfortunate side issue of the pistols. Uh, many of our audience uh, got it wrong. Uh, we're, we're to uh, progress the human spirit, not digress it. I remember, though, I didn't make it to the gig of just hearing reports. And they weren't pajamas. That was my idea of style. <laughs> oh, okay. Because they're also... Was... Black and white stripes, yes. Maybe I was confused because there's also the keyboard player for the Boomtown Rats, Johnny Fingers. Oh, who... very different. He didn't have elasticated cuffs on the ankles or the waist. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> there be the style issue. John, Jim Walker, the first pill drummer, was from Vancouver. I once asked Paul Cook about Jim Walker, and he said, you'll have to ask John about that. What can you tell the people about Jim Walker from Well, they Vancouver? wouldn't have known each other, so Paul was dead right. Uh, Jim Walker was a very strange character. Uh, he seemed open and friendly enough until he joined Pill, and I didn't quite understand the reasons for it, but he went very dark and somber there for a while, was which was a shame, and, and he didn't last very long. It was pretty incredible, though, a guy from Vancouver moving to England and then ending up in a band with you, John. Well, if you're good those. enough, that's what happens. Was that all through Melody Maker or through an ad? How did he end up in the actual band? I think I'd spotted an ad in a paper and, and kind of unwittingly thought, well, if, you know, why not? But it, it paid off. I mean, he was an excellent drummer. It was great, too, like from Vancouver, BC. All right, and he introduced, you know, a, a very nice free-flowing drum style, which uh, definitely gave wind to the theme tune of, of Public Image being Public Image. Van Miss him dearly. Very near. Apparently he's at the moment working in film. Oh, really? He also later formed the band The Pack, didn't he? The band The Yeah, well, Pack. he also moved to Israel to work in a kibbutz for some god unearthly reason. I mean, Jim's, Jim's a strange one, but fair play to him. Very near Vancouver is Seattle, Washington, and Pill have a song called Seattle. Was that song inspired by a lazy boy chair that was stolen by the band Green River who opened up for you when Pill played in Seattle? Uh, pardon? I didn't understand any of that. You talk too much and too, too slurry. Oh, okay, John Lydon. Here it is. You have the song Seattle by the yes. band Pill. When you play... Well, firstly, I'll tell you how Seattle was written. It's because we had a week off in the middle of a tour and we were stuck in Seattle. And so, we coined the song title, Seattle. It wasn't at the time very relevant to the song, really. But then years and years and years later were those riots you had in Seattle over the World Trade Order. Yes. And if you, if you check out some of the refrains in the song about palaces, barricades, threats, me promises. It shows a great deal of foresight on my part. 
I had heard John Lydon that the song Seattle was inspired also by a lazy boy chair, like a chair that had been stolen from you by the band that opened for a you. A chair? A chair had been <laughs> stolen. <laughs> like... The band that... I'm, sh I'm sure if that was the case, a chair would have been mentioned. Because <laughs> apparently it was about a band... A yeah, band but listen, when I write songs, they're not obtuse, right? <laughs> and if it was about a deck chair, I would have said so. So that's nonsense. John, when you did I'm a Celebrity, did you think about the movie Carry On Camping at all? Uh, I suppose it was in my psychology somewhat, being British and being that that's our, our fun-loving approach to such events. But no, mostly I did that to raise money for some charities that I was affiliated with. And I raised a substantial amount. Carry On Camping is... That was my only reason for doing it. Carry On Camping is probably the best Carry On movie, isn't it, though? It's kind of like how the English really are. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're very, very good at taking things seriously when we need to, but when we don't need to, we're very good at having fun. John Lydon, did you like being on Judge Judy? No. What I think, well, let me deal with the Judge Judy issue. That was a false accusation, and the man who made it clearly went for fame and fortune, rather dealing with any said accusation in a proper law court, he went to the TV. Uh, Judge Judy seen the, uh, the falseness in his claim, and indeed I won hands down. Uh, I didn't enjoy the environment at all, and the prospect of being judged on, by, by a, a, a TV company utterly appalled me. I, uh, uh, there's a worry I have about that kind of show, that that might just lead into trial by TV, as indeed the OJ fiasco showed, uh, where how a sensible judgment was not reached because of the TV aspect of it. Because I guess that's what I was wondering is, should all rock disputes be handled with Judge Judy? No. And indeed, I don't think you should judge the law as entertainment. Would you yourself ever consider going back to school and trying to become Judge Johnny at all? No. John Lydon, Time Zone uh -huh. with Africa Bombada was probably the first rock record with hip-hop. How did you hook yeah, up with... Not probably, it was. How did you hook up with Africa Bombada? Uh, mutual respect of the same kind of music. Uh, in the early days of, of uh of what we call hip-hop, which later turned into rap, people had much more open minds about, uh, about music. And you could be involving all genres of music and, and basically balancing them into a jolly good evening of dance with some social awareness lyrics. Uh, and so I took great joy of, of working with Africa Bambata, and I think we made a really excellent record. Unfortunately, of course, it didn't grab the, uh, the mainstream headliners, the later uh, pieces of work with uh, ACDC, uh, what was it? No, Aerosmith, and uh, uh, I can't remember his name now, Run TMC, because they definitely followed on our heels. How did you get together with the band Left Field, John? Um, through mutual acquaintances and... Uh, I used to work in uh, play centres for problem children before the Sex Pistols. My job was to uh, keep them off the streets and keep them safe and, and teach them a little thing or two about life. And indeed, one of left field, Neil, did the same job. And through a mutual friend who also did the same kind of work, uh, we got together. It took uh, just a little over a year before we fine-tuned it down to a proper rhythm and the lyrics flowed naturally. Unfortunately for us, and for me in particular, because I live in Los Angeles, you see, uh, the record was done some three months before its release. But on the day of release in Los Angeles, we had those dreadful forest fires. And so the refrain in the song, Burn Hollywood Burn, 
was automatically presumed that I was celebrating the forest fires of LA. I live in LA. I would never celebrate the burning of my house or anybody else's. Wrongly judged. But I think you are doing that song on this current tour, aren't you? With uh, I enjoy doing it, yes. That's in, a, in, in a slight, uh, well, yes, a more, more seriously, definitely different way. Because uh, that song, uh, in the studio, we used a lot of programming. And it, it was computer-led. But when, when I play live with Pill, we like to play it uh, analog. We like to play it on instruments. Although Public Image is well known for its, uh, its, uh, uh, its use of uh, technology, it's not the only thing we can do. John, I have the Sex Pistols on 8-track, believe it or not. I have the Sex Pistols on 8-track. Oh, eight, that's showing your age. 8-track cartridge. Actually, I bought it a couple of years ago for $25, which actually was a bargain. I heard it was going for 100 but I've researched this, and I found out that Pill... So you, you, have you still found a deck that plays 8-track? Yes, you can find them everywhere. Lots very of, good, because I've, I've still got some very old Roy Orbison. <laughs> Well, what I was wondering is Pill 2nd Edition, the metal box, Pill 2nd Edition in America, came out on 8-track. Do you have one at all, Johnny? I don't think it came out on 8-track, but it's definitely been re-released, uh, I think now, three or four years ago. I did a small deal with a very small label where we re-released it on vinyl. Apparently, according to the internet, it's actually on 8-track, Pill 2nd Edition. Uh, somebody might actually have it on 8-track. I don't know how it got there. It was never part of any arrangement I've had with a record company. Did you think that when you were doing album that you might have had 8-track, you know, like album, cassette, T-shirt, 8-track? Did that ever come into discussion? No, because the technology was already out of date. John Lydon, do you like Devo? Yeah. I had heard that Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo was asked to be your replacement in the Sex Pistols. Did you ever hear that? No. John, what's good about Samsonite travel pants? I don't suppose very much at all. They're uncomfortable and they cause terrible crease marks on your trousers. Although Samsonite, they make fairly decent suitcases, uh, made a brilliant line in travel pants uh, some years ago, which I still have to this day. Uh, what I liked most about them was they had zips from the ankle all the way up to the hip on each leg. And you could open it up, and then there was a nylon mesh which would let your legs breathe more easily in hotter climates. Speak very, very excellent. They looked very smart. Be I could not understand why they never took off as an idea. Samsonite travel pants. Mm -hmm. Did you use those when you went to South Africa? Because you did some shark cage diving. That no, was incredible. I, th I think you'd be rather insane in, 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 in nylon mesh and thin, thin linen <laughs> to be climbing up and down mountains in South Africa because I met many a gorilla pack there. And, and you certainly can't be wearing them diving for great whites. When you were in Africa, did you visit Ginger Baker at all? No. What it's in a completely different part of the continent. What's it's, it? It's, Africa's a very large country. I just thought because maybe you had done some stuff with them before that you might yeah, have... Yeah, no, when you do these kind of filming, you're on a very tight budget, and you don't get any time really to go off wondering. How, what was it like with the sharks when you were down with the sharks Thrilling. in a cage? Thrilling, because I'd studied marine biology and had a, an interest in sharks, I suppose, ever since I'd seen Jaws, uh, and naturally followed it through. Uh, they're much more magnificent in the flesh, shall we say, than they are dead or stuffed in museums. You they're a thrilling creature, and I totally respect them. John, you did As indeed I do all, all walks of life, all frames of life. Iggy Pop, John, did an ad in the UK for insurance. Naughty Holder from Slade did a great fish and chips ad, and you did an amazing one for butter. Yeah, well, that was a product I actually believed and backed and supported, because uh, British products uh, in Britain are getting a, a hard shift of it. 
and foreign exports are killing what, what is British commerce. And so I was quite happy to back that. It, it had one of the best enemy headlines ever. The New Music Express had the headline, John Lydon revives country life butter sales. That was a great headline. Yes, apparently by some 87%. So it was a successful campaign all round. But the, the point being, that, uh, at the time, there was a lot of negativity that was uh, slung at me, that I was somehow selling out and becoming commercial. Well, I will always be commercial when it's backing British product. Indeed, I am a British product myself. And you are John Lydon. And John, when shooting that ad, I noticed a whole bunch of cows chasing after you. What was that like? How was well, it there was something like a script. But the people that um, picked me for this campaign had the common sense to let me play with that. And so there was a lot of improvising, which is why it works so well. That's the real John having fun. Preparing for this pill tour, John, what sort of food do you eat? My friend, Ronnie... Country life butt up. <laughs> What sort of other food or what sort of drinks do you have? Because my friend Ronnie from the band The Muffs saw you in Venice at one time having a smoothie. Do you like smoothies? No, he's telling a lie. I don't drink smoothies. What do you drink then to prepare for a tour? Uh, Brussels sprout juice. John, at one time you gave a special sandwich with salty tasting mayo. Yeah, well, we'll not go there, thank you. Okay, how about the Quadrophenia? Phil Daniels recently said you, John, were almost Jimmy in Quadrophenia. Yes, I was. Who were you? Yeah, I, I went for that role because Pete Townsend asked me to, but uh, I had a, a somewhat of a disagreement with the Who's manager. And so it, ne it never came about, which is a shame because uh, although Phil Daniels did a fantastic job, got to say, but I could have added something to that. What did you think, John, about the mod revival bands like the Purple Hearts or the Chords or the Merton Parkas? Were you kind of... I'm never very much interested in revivalism in that way uh, because uh, I have a better term for it. I call it genre hopping. It's too easy for you to pick up on what somebody else has done and then it's like stealing someone's coat and claiming it as your own. When you really should be spending your time creating something completely new from your own sense of individuality. Is Understand? I do indeed. And is that what the Public Image Limited song Memories was about? No. John, I was also curious about Hawkwind. Over the years, people have wondered what exactly was your role. Like, were you their LSD supplier? Were you another? <laughs> were you their roadie? Were you another Harry in the crowd? What was your role, John? <laughs> well, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of a suitable refrain for the, the for the, the letters LSD. But no, that was not my role. They were a band that were great fun live. And I used to love, at an early age, uh, traveling off to uh, the, the rock festivals, and usually on my own. And uh, Hawkwind would always be playing those kind of events. And I, I love that sense of community you, you could get from the very early uh, uh, festivals. Uh, these days, those kind of festivals, they're too orchestrated, you feel manipulated, and it's... You can't even go to the toilet without a credit card. And so it, it's, uh, it's taken on a different, different role for me. It's not really community run or community uh, appreciated. It's more constructed and contrived. But at the same time, good bands do play them. I do them myself from time to time because indeed you have to. Otherwise you'll starve. That's the business we live in. John, when you're going through customs, you've seen an awful lot. Did you actually... No, I'd put it a better way than that. The customs have seen an awful lot of me. Yeah, Boom, <laughs> yes, they have indeed. But I was curious... I don't know what it is they're looking for, but honestly, it's, it's, it's back to Brussels sprout juice, which I will, I will always... And, and baked beans and cabbage. Uh, I will eat these things before I take a long flight because I'm aware of what customs may be trying to pull on me at the other end, or pull off me.
to be more accurate. Didn't you once encounter a customs guy that had an actual mohawk? That must have made you feel at ease, a customs guy. Well, it's like the times they are a-changing. I, I found it deeply hilarious and, and heartwarming in, in an odd way. Do you still like... You know, welcome to Britain. Yes, we're going to strip search you with mohawks. <laughs> Just to make you fit in. <laughs> it's odd that a hairdo that's actually the symbol uh, uh, against repression has been incorporated into repression. What but on the other hand, I do kind of understand airport security because... Um, as I've let it be known, me and my wife were once booked on that Lockerbie flight, that Pan Am special, and we missed that flight uh, because my wife was slow at packing, so we changed it to the next day. And if we were on that plane, we would have been blown up. Uh, so I do understand airport security because I, I don't think anyone innocent should, should have to suffer that way. And it's not so much you being blown to smithereens, it's, it's what it did to my family members who had all presumed that I'd caught the flight and seen that on the news, that it was blown out of the sky. It's, it's quite, quite, you know, unnerving. And so my view on terrorism, as indeed my view on all, all acts of violence, is uh, negative. John, how about the Exploited and Crass? You've expressed an interest in liking those bands. Have you seen Exploited? They're still on the circuit, out there playing. Oh, they are what they are. They, st you know, they stick to their guns. It's a limited range, but that's fine for them. It, they do what they enjoy, and they do it really well. And, and so, more power to them. People who do this because they like what they're doing are the people that interest me. Well, for instance, the vibrators are still going. The vibrators are still playing. I think they're. Oh, so they should. With a battery change, anything is possible. Ba Boom! Yes, they are still rocking, and we're still rocking here with John Lydon, live from his place in Los Angeles, California. I'm Nardwar, the Human Serviette. Pill are coming up on tour very soon. Going to be hitting all the stages all across North America. And John, I was wondering, did the Ruts play better reggae than the Clash? Who? The Ruts. Did the Ruts play better reggae than the Clash? Neither of them, and they shouldn't have bothered to try and mess with a musical format that neither of them t uh, understood too well. I mean, apart from my many things in life, I mean, I, I was DJing reggae in reggae clubs uh, at 15 years old. Um, and because for me, where I come from, Finsbury Park, was a very working class mixed culture neighborhood so reggae to me was very naturally part of my backdrop i didn't think it was with those two outfits and i think it showed and and also the police when they went into that roxanne vibe they were on the wrong side of the hoof john what about the band magma they are amazing they had their yeah, own tru truly truly masterful stunning work they had their own language. What can you tell the people about Magma and their own language? Well, They're there were several of those bands, and there was a term for it. Uh, Europa something or the other. I can't remember now off the top of my head. I found the, the new language part a little intellectual and a little contrived and conceited. But uh, as the European community has been evolving over the decades... Um, there is a kind of Frangres, Italiano, Deutsche, Englishness that's creeping in. It's, it's quite a good thing to be uh, multi-languaged multi and indeed open to multiculturalism. It means no more war, you understand? And that's what we that, want. That we start to celebrate our differences rather than bitterly oppose them. Something the Republicans in this country could do well to learn from. John, was the Can remix record called Sacrilege? Was that name? I, I don't know the remix. Uh, uh, for me, Can was as it was originally, as I used to see them live. Because I heard that they named the record Sacrilege because you wouldn't do a remix. In other words, it would be sacrilegious to mess with Can material, and that's why they called it Sacrilege.
Who did the remix? Well, I thought that you were asked to do a remix. Oh, I was... Uh, yes, this is true. My gosh, this is so long back now. Um, I wouldn't do it. And they called it Sackman. No, I see, I see no reason to, because it's... Why do I need to stick my name on their hard-earned work? If they want to remix their own material, that's well and fine. They have every right to. But the last thing a band that good need is a bunch of outsiders hobnobbing with, with, with their material. Kind of destructive, really. How when record companies allow what took so much effort to be so original in the first place, to be just thrown out there to a bunch of preposterous new young brats on the block, it's not a good thing. Do you yourself have any can bootlegs? How much can... No. No, no I never, ever, ever have bought a bootleg in my life. I never will. It's uh, thievery. What do you remember about playing with Screaming Lord Such? Uh, how funny he was. Not much else. Uh, he actually did understand reggae, and he did it extremely well. He was bang on the money, because he was brought up in that environment. It wasn't him jumping on a bandwagon. Screaming Lord Such was pure, good, jolly, decent reggae, actually. Here is a letter from June 18th, 1976, from the New Musical Express, and it says, I'd love to see the Pistols make it. Maybe they'll be able to afford some clothes, which don't look like they've been slept in. <laughs> and do you know, John Lydon... How sweet, but the point being, uh, yes, many of my clothes when I'm on tour, I do sleep in. Because you can't be lugging huge suitcases of stuff around with you. It slows you down. And when you have to leave very early in the morning from one hotel to another and travel great distances, the last thing you want to be doing is remembering where all your different accoutrements are. And so, you know, it's at nice, but unless you're volunteering to carry my suitcases around for me, I'm going to look like I've slept in my clothes. And that's it, period, the end. And do you know who wrote that letter? Stephen Morrissey. He was the one that wrote that letter. Stephen Morrissey. Oh. Morrissey. Oh, him with the flowers. Yes, he wrote that in June 18th. 19th. How sweet. He'd do anything to get famous. <laughs> Send that man a dandelion. <laughs> did you ever see him around L.A. at all? Uh, he came to a Pistols gig we did here at the Greek Theatre. He didn't mention the letter that he wrote then from 1976. No, that would be utterly ridiculous. Um, How about... It's very, very difficult to meet people backstage because you're full of angst and care about your own gig and you can't be getting involved in, in, uh, in, in distracting conversations. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's nev I've never found it easy to socialise at my own venues. I'd much rather leave, you know, as soon as I come off the stage, because uh, it's too hard. You, you, you're not in any fit frame of mind to, uh, to debate anything on any serious level, because you're exhausted. How about some of your old friends from Britain? Have you had them over? Has Billy Idol ever been to your house? Have you ever talked to him very much in L.A.? Uh, he turned up here years ago with Steve Jones on a bunch of Harley Davidsons. Oh, and I think the Clash bass player w was with them. And I told him to go away because the noise was appalling. <laughs> Billy Idol was recently asked to be the singer of Aerosmith. Do you think he would be a good choice as the singer of Aerosmith, Billy well, what's Idol? what's wrong with the current bloke? I think there was some sort of issues going on for a while and they needed a replacement temporarily. Oh, that's sad. No, you shouldn't do that. Billy wouldn't be into that, would he? Do you know what I mean? When you do that, you're taking something away. You're not making it better. Although Paul Rogers singing Queen songs kind of worked. Yes, and of course, Paul Rogers lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada as Does well. Does he now? <laughs> have I put my psychic left foot in it? <laughs> yes, you have indeed. Another Vancouver connection. Paul Rogers is stunning. I've seen him recently. Sing. It was fantastic. I just, I, there's something good about that bloke. But then I loved Free very, very much. 
when I was young. They they were the festival band of all time. In the new movie, The Runaways, we see Joan Jett making her own Sex Pistols t-shirt. Oh, you've seen that now. What? Is it out? Uh, yes, it is. Right, I've got a song in it. <laughs> what do you think about The Runaways? What did you think about The Runaways? Well, they were a fun band at the time, and, and it was good to see from America that girls could take on the men. Although we were used to that in England through punk, because there were many girl bands who held their own with men bands. Uh, and gee, we viewed each other as equals. So it was kind of neat that Americans were offering the same perspective. But it wasn't really. It was still girls' day out. Well, speaking of Vancouver and movies, did you ever see the movie Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains that had Paul Cook and Steve Jones in it that was filmed in Vancouver? Yeah, there were some strange scenes in that. <laughs> Which ones did you think were strange? I'm not going to go into it, but, you know, <laughs> it kind of backfired on poor Paul Cook. <laughs> and I use the word backfire quite deliberately. Paul will get it, and anyone who's seen the film will. But go on. Oh, what was the last DVD that you rented? Uh, I, I tend not to. What was the last movie? If it's not available on cable, then I'm not really interested. Uh, I don't enjoy going to cinemas because uh, it's too many people want to want to talk to me, uh, and so I'm I'm not allowed to be myself. It, it's very difficult when when you've become a public figure and you're known. It's uh, you get very little time out. John Lydon, as indeed as you told me, somebody spotted me drinking a smoothie here. You know, I mean, how how irrelevant is that? Well, I think that might have been the highlight of his week to see oh, you drinking a that's, smoothie. Oh, that's so not right and, and, and so misunderstanding me. You know, I, I view myself as a regular human being and, and, and I don't like people to interrupt my regular processes. John, the band The Desperate Bicycles, they were one of the first DIY punk bands. They had the guitarist Dan Electro. Do you remember The Desperate Bicycles at all? No. How about alternative TV? What did you think of alternative TV? Uh, quite interesting. So, uh, but this is this is going back way back, and I mean, there's been a hundred thousand bands since. But uh, these were great bands, really, because of the the difference that punk w was offering. There were so many variations. Um, it's a shame that punk over the years has become uh, ill-defined by. Nonsense like, I suppose, Courtney Love to one extreme, celebrating drugs and vapid stupidity, and then the other, Green Day, celebrating spiky hair and a, a studded leather jacket. And ne neither of those two statements really uh, have managed to um, come up with anything valid, verbal-wise. They're not for the improvement of the human race. They're just there to mimic and, and quite frankly, mock us. One of my favorite bands from that era, as well as the Sex Pistols, was The Boys. They are still going with the Vibrators, too. The Boys. Do you remember The Boys at yep. all the first time? Yeah, I met them a few times. They, they could be all right. When any of these... But again, it's that backstage scenario. You know, I mean, uh, ACDC, too. Um, uh, Judas Priest. I mean, all these bands. I mean, I love to say hello. But it's when you come off stage... There's not much more you can be offering in terms of conversation. And, and it's, for me, it's not nice to hear, great show, Johnny. It's, it's, it's kind of irritating. And so, myself, when I go to see other bands, I don't like to go backstage because I realize what, what a challenging, compromising situation that can be on, to both sides. It's a real pressure. But I suppose it's the only way, really, fellow musicians can get to meet because we don't really have any any social network outside of that at least i don't have you had a chance to meet many of the heroes in an american punk rock at all or canadian punk rock such as jello biafra have you met jello from the dead kennedys at mm. all yes i have I met him backstage at San Francisco once. I met him also another time uh, doing an interview in uh, uh, Boston with uh, a DJ then at the time. His name was Oedipus. 
Um, and both times I thought he talked too much and over-intellectualized everything, and it seemed kind of humorless. And whatever his personal agenda was, I thought it was too predominant for me. There, there was no, you know, give it a break, you know, lay off the showbiz and just be a human. He was too busy selling himself. Deliberately trying to be outrageous, which is always nauseating. Well, he's done quite a bit of music and he's still doing it, so at least yeah, he's still he'd doing be it. Yeah, better off letting that talk for him, because it, it, it can be stifling a conversation with him. Johnny, last you know, it's everything has to be explained instantly, and, and, and I, I disagree. There, there are times where, as human beings, we just need to socialise in a more friendly way. And indeed, you can learn far more from humour than you can deadpan seriousness. And Johnny, it's not a war all the time. You don't have to walk around wearing your ang. Who do you think was your favorite American punk band? Did you like the Avengers who played with the Pistols? I never viewed it that way, and I've always bitterly disagreed with um, those kind of definitions. Uh, in fact, I never really accepted the term punk or any category. Anything that labels us lessens us. I myself have tried to help spread the word of pill quite a bit when I've been interviewing bands. I interviewed a Canadian band called Simple Plan. I don't know if you've heard about them. They were like a pop punk band and they were wearing some t-shirts which were really generic and I thought I would give them a pill shirt to wear during the interview. So I gave them a pill shirt to wear during the interview. So I've tried to give pill shirts to bands that I think should wear pill shirts. I would find that a little compromising to my personal philosophy because I don't insist that anyone should wear anything that I've dictated to them. They didn't keep the shirt on that Although I do understand your sense of fun. But the fact is that they put it on at all shows a weakness of personality. <laughs> and or they'd be more than happy for the gift. Well, actually... It's they... a fine line between the two, isn't it? Yes, and they took the shirt right off after that. So... Oh, but at least you put it on. What a mug. <laughs> yes, simple plan. I, 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 think, I, think, I think you scored kudos there. <laughs> Thank... you, showed, you showed a basic inadequacy in his psychology. Well, thanks so much, John Lydon. Anything else you'd like to add to the people out there at all? Yes, Public Image, the band that really, really has changed the landscape of music. We've uh, created so many different genres in and, in, in and to ourselves, and there's so many bands out there that are currently hugely popular that have given more than a nod and a wink to our forms of music and have claimed it as their own. Well, hello. Come and have a listen to Grandad, because I'm the one what taught them <laughs> what was safe. <laughs> and indeed, those musical formats I'm talking about were not safe for me to be inventing at the time. Uh, I don't deliberately go out of my way to be different. It just seems to happen, because the subject matter I'm dealing with matters so much to me at a personal level. I'm singing from the heart and the soul. I am a folk musician at heart. And I do not give a nod and a wink to others when I'm writing my songs. They're about what I think matter. I'm not imitating. I'm not faking. Public image is a valid, valid operation. Always will be. And that's not bad from a man who's 50 years young. Well, thanks so much, John. Keep on rocking in the free world and do 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 do. <laughs> Come on, you gooners! <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for your time, John. If Arsenal could be of any more assistance to Canadian soccer, I'm more than happy. <laughs> Long live the Vancouver Whitecaps, right? That's a brilliant combination. I must get their shirt. <laughs> we'll have to get one to you. Ah. I'm sure I can procure my own. <laughs> and we'll also get you an 8-track, too, from 2nd Edition. If people are listening, maybe they can send you the 8-track. I've eight never track. seen it. I, I, I pay no attention to what's available on eBay, you understand. <laughs>
but maybe somebody from their personal collection. But I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one for collecting memorabilia, least of all of myself. Well, I want to say your bandmate, Paul, was really nice because when I talked to him in 1996... Oh, Paul Cook? Yes. Oh, well, he's just a genuinely nice bloke. When, when I talked to him in 1996, when you played in Vancouver, I told him about the Ladies and Gentlemen, the Fabulous Stains movie. He didn't have a copy. I offered to bring a copy to the gig, and then he put me on the guest list, and I went backstage and met him. Yeah. So that no, was... he's a nice person. And then it's really great that now his daughter is playing in the Slits. Yes, that's very good. And, Little Holly. And then now you have a member of the Slits in your band, Johnny, on the Pill Tour. Listen, my stepdaughter is the lead singer of the Slits. And you have I don't need any more Slit members. <laughs> well, thanks so much again, John, and keep hey. on rocking in the free world. May the road rise and your enemies always be behind you. Okay, talk to you later. All right. Okay, bye.